This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 120, Moco Rengito Herere Revisited. In episodes 111 and 112, I told you the story of three-year-old Moco Rengito Herere, who died on August 10, 2015, while in the care of a woman his mother considered a friend. Moko is well known in New Zealand as one of the country's worst cases of child abuse, but Moko himself was so much more than that. For this episode, I was honored to speak with Moko's mom, Nicola Dali Paki, who told me all about her headstrong little boy, who was wise beyond his young age, and who packed a lifetime of experiences into his three short years. She also told me about her experiences since Moko's death, how it feels to be recognizable everywhere she goes and the ways she strives to protect other children like Moko. This is the story of Moko Rengiro Hediri Revisited. I'd like to give a quick shout-out to my newest patrons, Lindsay G. from Middleville, Michigan, Summer W. from Clinton, Kentucky, Brittany L. from Mill Creek, Washington, and from the fabled Parts Unknown, thank you to D. G. I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of you, I'm working my hardest to continue devoting myself full-time to the podcast, which I can't do without your help. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. If you'd like to make a pledge, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. I have to apologize again. My voice isn't back to 100%, but it is almost there, so please bear with me while I sound a little raspy here and there. As you may remember, several weeks ago, Moko was the subject of episodes 111 and 112 of this podcast. If you haven't yet heard those episodes, you may want to go back and listen to those because there is a lot to Moko's story. I had hoped to release a third part at the time, but I wasn't able to make it happen. I've been in contact the whole time with Moko's mom, Nicola, and we were finally able to connect this week for a conversation that I'm thrilled to share with you. I'm always talking about the warrior moms who turn their grief and anger into the motivation to make change, and Nicola is most definitely a powerhouse among their ranks. In the seven years since Moko's death, after which she endured countless court hearings for the criminal case and the coroner's inquest, Nicola has accomplished more than many of us will do in a lifetime. She joined a domestic violence campaign called Let Me Speak. She earned a diploma in Fano Ora Maori Social Services. She began studying law at Auckland University of Technology before the COVID-19 pandemic interrupted that. Now she's a Maori social worker helping other victims of domestic violence. She wants to finish her law degree and become a Maori legal advocate. She's also founded a charity, Justice for Moko's Legacy, raising money for domestic violence organizations, and more. On top of that, she's managed to hold on to her sense of humor, and she shared with me some of her funniest memories of Moko. Nicola is an incredibly strong woman and mother who is proud of her Maori heritage and has devoted her life to helping others, and it was an honor and a privilege to speak with her this past weekend. With that, here's my conversation with Moko's mom, Nicola Dali Paki, who starts off by giving us a beautiful greeting in her native tongue, Tadeo Maori. My guest on the show today is Nicola Dali Paki, Moko's mom. It's so great to talk to you. Kia ora, tēnā koe. It's lovely to talk to you too. Nei rata mihi atu ki a koe te tua hine, he uri tēnei o ngā pohi ngā te tūwhare toa mani a poto tainau atu ki manu āriki, a tua tahi ka mihi atu au ki te atua a iho matua kore nā nei hānei te ao katoa. Tua rua ka mihi atu au ki tō tātou kīngi a kīngi tū heitia, bō tātou te whero whero te tua whitu. 
whakawhetaihia na mahi katoa i tēnei rā i raru e te māhau te kingi tanga a rire rire haupai mārire. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm so glad we are able to do this and that we'll be able to talk a little bit about Moko. And I know, as you had said, that the last article that came out didn't focus on him as much as you'd like. So I'm glad to be able to give him that platform. Well, I'd really like to take the opportunity to talk about Moko, who he was. He was very mischief. He would be what I would consider in our culture, a rangatira of our whanau, our family. Um, he was always leading his older siblings into strife <laughs> majority <laughs> of the time. He lived life large. He lived life to the fullest. I always wondered why he was so extreme in, in the things that he said and he did that really stuck with me. And then when he had passed, I got it. I Not completely, but you sort of understand why things were so extreme. Um, why he did and said things in a very large forum for such a little man. Um, he lived a short life, but he lived a very large life. I'll give him that, and I'm so proud of him. Wow. Yeah, he really sounded like a, a big personality and, and such a sweet boy for such a, as you said, a naughty boy. <laughs> yeah, naughty boy label. That is who he is. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's the number five in numerology, so he was a he's a born leader. You know, he he marched to the own beat of his drums. Honestly, he didn't. You 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 had structure and routine, and then you had Moko just dancing on that line of structure and routine. Oh. <laughs> he was the highlight of our home. <laughs> you could just see the life in his eyes. He's just got that sparkle. He looks like such an entertaining kid. Oh, he was. He was. There were some pretty dark times in our past, but, you know, Moko was like the light of being amongst it all. I used to um, look past everything that was around me and just see him and just know that, you know, this is why I'm doing it. This is why I'm, I'm going to keep going, why I'm going to cop it on the chin and just keep going. It's because of that light that was in front of me. He was honestly um, the beacon of our family. As as the youngest it would call the runt, but he was he he was like the leader, the oldest. He told his eldest brother where to go and how to do about it. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you want to talk about? Pretty much anything you want to talk about, because I know you know it's hard to control the narrative of what people do publish about you, especially when you're so much in the public eye after such an awful thing happens. Well, I don't like it as as. I think I've said previously I like to stay private because we were quite segregated back then. But I try to just turn the infamy into something positive. You know, it's a way for me to connect with our people when I'm on the call face trying to um, help others. Um, and it allows them to feel safe to be able to open up to me to what's going on what's really going on in their, in their home lives when the doors are closed and people, they think people aren't watching. Um, it can be difficult sometimes when people are constantly staring at me. I don't like that bit. Um, I try to remember my father's words that I was beautiful, but then I know sometimes that's not the case. It's more of why is she still here and how do you live with yourself and all those nasty things. But you know what? They don't pay me rent to live in my head. So, yeah, I sort of chopped that behaviour or those thoughts down quite some time ago. Something that I wanted to talk about tonight is the justice system here in New Zealand, what had happened with the perpetrators who had viciously attacked my son. One of their lawyers was actually married to the Crown Prosecutor. From what I understand, it was explained to us in the courtroom it was a closed gallery, I think, at that time, so that the information wasn't released to anybody else, that um, they were married and the manslaughter plea bargain that was um, agreed to was made between this husband and wife who was the Crown Prosecutor in charge of this case. And the um, so she was the wife and the husband was one of the defendant's lawyers, legal representatives. Now, from what I understand, as it was explained to us, that we were, they were all professionals and, you know, they were handling the process properly. But in, in my mind, um, I was quite narrow in my thoughts and quite angered that this is this is not right. This is not professional. 
and this is actually the New Zealand justice system, you know, maybe we would have got more respect or more cause mana wouldn't have been so trampled in that sentencing if they had of done things appropriately by not even coming to a plea bargain between a husband and wife, the Crown Prosecutor and the defendant's lawyer. But that's sadly um, where New Zealand is at. Well, I wouldn't say Aotearoa because I know as Māori, we would whakamukiai te mana motuhake and kāhui taumata would actually have served justice um, pertaining to the mana of my pipi moko. Yeah, it seems like such a huge conflict of interest. That really does surprise me that they allowed that to happen. I was quite shocked too. I was actually enraged. I remember being escorted out because I had been quite verbal about it. And I remember just boosting all the way from Rotorua over to Tokorua and marching into my legal representative's office and, and just infuriated at why and asking, because that's always who I would go to, um, Armangapo asking her, why is this happening? How can this happen? I didn't understand too much about discrimination back then, um, so I didn't know how to process that feeling or that thought of what the heck just happened, um, why did this just happen, and she was quite calm about it, and she explained it to me because she she'd been so experienced in the field, she'd seen it a lot, that, well, 50000 was just saved by that husband and wife completing that deal, that plea bargain, you know, that saved the justice system 50000 by dropping it down to a manslaughter. Uh, as, and ultimately at that time, I don't know what it is now, but that's how much it cost to run a trial back in those days, well, nearly under half a decade ago. But I felt as though if my child was white with blue eyes and fair skin and did not have a Māori and Spanish name, as in Muko and then Saviour, Rangi Tohiriri, there may have been justice prevailed for his sake. It's awful to have to think that way, but I'm sure that that's something that's come to your attention a lot more. Yeah, it really started the fire in my puku and my belly to want to learn and understand more why and how how can this happen. And and it actually was it shocked my system to look into things and see that this was quite a normal trend. It was blown up by mainstream media that this was the highest sentence ever served for manslaughter. But come on, we know it was murder. Right. You know, we can't put your foot around the truth. You can pretty it up, but we know when we know the facts, why are we watering it down? You know? Right. There's nothing that those people did that was not intentional. Exactly, exactly. And if anything, it was all premeditated. You know, I was framed. I was investigated by police and they asked me these really, really odd questions. Sorry, not investigated, interrogated. I would not call that a normal investigation where a grieving parent should have to sit through and be asked those questions. And so, you know, it was very abrupt and very confronting as though I understood what was going on. And the questions that they were asking me were starting to make me sick. And, and you know, pretty much laying it on me that I had dropped him off half dead to her. Oh. Yeah, I was I was lucky that while the kids were in Starship with me, um, Moko had some namu namus, or we call them like itchy bites when I was showering him and I called Liz and one of the nurses and I said, hey, what's this? Because staying in the hospital at that time, it was only a couple of nights, I think I had them there before it got too much. She had explained to me, go and take them downstairs to ED and we'll let them know that you're coming. Um, just get them fully examined just in case it could be something I was hoping like not measles or something um it was just some normal itchy bites he had a full body examination done and um that i think that's what could have been part of the reason that saved me in terms of being framed for what had happened to him you could see he his body was clearly fine and didn't have all that torturous evil things done to him that's good i'm so glad that that actually uh, was something that happened just before yeah, it saved me that and also the fact that I had taken them to the dairy by, so it was like um, a shop, to get them chocolate before I had dropped him off. And Muko had a habit of climbing out of his seat because I had parked the car right up by the front door. So you could see, like, it was, like, illegally parked. Yes, I did it. But you know what? At least I could see my kid when I was going to the counter to get the chocolate. He jumped out of his car seat. He got out of his straps 
he climbed through the front um, to the front door, which was open, and he walked into the store. And you, and I said, I told him, check the cameras, because I remember when I I got him a chocolate. I remember him climbing out of the car. I said, it's the dairy by the gecko. It was like this um, club that my cousin used to work at, or a restaurant bar club thing, over in Popol, down in Sufaritua, where it all took place. So those two factors and also the fact that it was made out like I had just dumped them when actually I had put in her account over a $1,000 in certain amounts each week to look after my children. Um, I told them, they said, oh, how did you do that being in Starship? Well, in Starship, there was a post office. And in the post office back then, I don't know if I still have it, there was a Kiwi bank who she was banking with. And that's where I had deposited all the money each week. Um, and I told them to check her bank account that I would never just, you know, abandon my kids like that and not support them in any way. Cause the way that it came across, like I had just dropped them off, you know, half done and she pretty much finished it. That's, that's sort of how it came across. Right. Right. And it just doesn't seem like that's accurate at all. No, I would never do that. Like I did a lot of gangster shit back in my, my time, but never anything conflicting like that, honestly. And especially to my power. He was he was a mummy's boy. Both my boys are, but yeah. He was really a mummy's boy. I'd never do that to him. Or even any of my kids. It was it was the most horrific it was it's like stool embedded in my head. The sight that I saw when I had to identify him. It was like a horror, like, and I could stomach horrors. I actually love horrors, but that's a horror that, that has stuck with me that I don't like, um, was seeing him um, visibly citing him and what, what had been inflicted on him and not but knowing at that stage because I hadn't been interrogated. I was only there in the morgue to identify him. Just, you know, those thoughts of what the hell has happened to my child? Why does he look like that? He was barely identifiable. Um, it was that bad that we had to cover him. I've had to cover him in a Spider-Man suit and put glasses on him for his, what we call the um, pangihana, for his funeral, um, where we have our whānau, our tupapaku and the whānau pani wrap around our tupapaku for so many days um, so that we can mourn together and other Uris and our Uri can all come together to mourn for our loss. But our elders were quite upset as to why he was dressed the way that he was because um, I had covered him up with that and, and a bandana, a red bandana, because he loved it, his hanky um, across his face because, you know, ultimately it was his siblings that had to say their goodbyes too and that's not how I wanted them to see their sibling, um, the last memories. That was something that I've, I'm still growing from. You know, that pain doesn't go away, but you grow through it. You know, you you, you get stronger when you those memories come flooding and those those feelings, those sensations come flooding through your body. I'm just so sorry you have to have that memory in your head at all. No mother should have to see that. It's not your fault. You know, you, you shouldn't have to apologize. You know what? It's he shouldn't he shouldn't even have been gone. You know, if if he was a little bit more fairer, if his eyes were more coloured, you know, if he had a fairer name that fit into society, they they probably would have got a second opinion from another doctor. You know, they wouldn't have turned off the resuscitation. They wouldn't have stopped it, sorry, um, his life support. It was a subtle youth in Asia, what has happened to Mokor. Like, people don't get it. They look at, you know, I, I effed up. Yep, I own it. Um, social workers effed up. No, they passed the buck. Let's not even go there in terms of who was involved at that stage. But in terms of our healthcare system, it's really, really prejudiced here in Aotearoa. Um, there could have been second opinions been made, you know. They could have notified his Bano. They knew where to find me a few weeks prior to when he had passed. They had actually served a, a warrant, a summons for me to um, testify against my a, a domestic violence incident that had happened in the past. Um, they wanted me to be able to turn up in Tokoro knowing that I was in Starship because they arrived there in the room. But then all of a sudden, when Moko was on life support, nobody knew that he was my son. Like, he's got the same surname as his father. 
red flags in the system. I already knew that from previous situations that had gone down. It's an absolute joke, honestly. And it's taken me about three, it took me about three years to fight with the district health board for the medical records as to his final moments and what examinations were completed, who was involved, all that's being blacked out. There's actually a current pending investigation at the moment with the Health and Disability Commissioner as to what went down and how and why. But I, I believe, I strongly believe it was subtle euthanasia. That's not identified or highlighted a lot in our country. It happens quite a lot, especially to Māori, to our people. But it was absolutely a subtle euthanasia that had happened. It was preventable too, if you know, if they had of tried harder, even ten days prior, when there was a notification that did go out, if they had have physically cited him, we might have still had a chance. And even then, um, when they had him on life support, had another medical expert come in. That was only one opinion, you know, one group of people. You could, you, I'm sure we are entitled to at least three. Moko should have had proper care all around. It just sounds like he was failed by all of the systems that were supposed to protect him and, and help him. And It had on there that CYF, so State Ward, were on the phone at the time. They knew what was going on and that ultimately they were in the care. She was caring for them, but they were actually children of um, CYF. That's not true. I legally had custody of my children. That's what's on the medical records. When they filed their applications, they also said that. And then I presented my day-to-day -day care orders and it was just dismissed, you know. But that's how it is here in New, in New Zealand. That's that's how they roll. It, it all seems like extremely unfair treatment. And I can see why you fight so hard now for your people and for what's right. We have to because ultimately it's going to be my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren that are going to continue to suffer. You know, the cycles only break when we break them ourselves. And if that means that we lose a fight, but we carry the legacy to pass on for the next generation to keep fighting, then so be it. There must be our purpose here in this realm. But I don't think that our people should just give up and think that this is this is normal. Because it's been socially acceptable for so long, through gen many generations, it's, you know, we, apparently we, we're getting better treatment these days. No, it can get so much better. You know, we, we deserve equal rights here in Aotearoa yeah. as every other culture. Too much has happened in the past to our tupuna, our ancestors, for us to just start laying down now. They've, they've fought so hard to get us to where we are. If we if we stop fighting now, that dishonors them and it, and it doesn't do anything for our next generation. That's right. It's got to be just so frustrating, like banging your head against the wall. It builds a fire in my puku, in my belly, and it creates passion to learn more knowledge. Um, I have, like it said in the article, I have no intentions to enter the bar, but I have a thirst to understand law and why these things are happening and how do we fix this. It's not about being the victims in the situation. For me personally, everybody has their own journey, but for me personally, it's not about being the victim in the situation. It's about being the survivor and finding a resolution. You know, if we do the poor me, poor me, I just want to be poor me. We're not going to get nowhere. But for me, it's about becoming more knowledgeable and finding a resolution to get through these things so it doesn't affect our next generation. That's amazing. Honestly, you're a very inspiring person based on everything you've done and how far you've come and everything you're accomplishing. It's it's incredible. Oh, thank you. I'm just a mom. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a few people say that, and, and uh, I don't think you give yourself enough credit. But I think you sounded like an amazing mom before, and now you're you're still continuing to live your life for your children, all three of them. You know, I wasn't an angel, but I learned and I, I did love my children. I wasn't perfect, but I definitely learned and I always loved them unconditionally. But, um, I just don't see myself the way that others see me. I just see me as a mum. And don't all mums, you know, when it comes to our babies, how protective we are, you'll do anything to protect them. And I just mm -hmm. feel the things that I'm doing is, you know, protecting he may not be here in the physical realm, but protecting his legacy by continuing to help others bring about change from this ugly situation that has happened and prevent it from happening to other children in the future. And I saw you were uh, talking about Oranga Tamariki, right? 
Yeah, I don't like using that that word. We we like to use OT. It's like a rip-off version of Otangare, this place in the far north, naughty north where I'm from. But I'd rather rip off that name than actually rip off our language to something that doesn't align to what Te Ao Māori is in terms of the processes and policies. So it, it has, I mean, I guess the idea behind it was good in the in the beginning when they first created the organization, but it doesn't sound like it's done what it was intended to do. I don't think it had good intentions from the get go, to be honest. Like, and we, you know, and I appreciate that perspective, but I honestly believe it was a process to be a subtle genocide of our whakapapa, our bloodline. You know, they take the land and then they take the people. And it was a subtle way to do it. I know elders of, um, not mine personally, but who, nah, they are mine too, through connections to our whakapapa, who have been taken, uplifted for taking milk off doorsteps. Like that's state care for kids who were just being kids and pinching milk bottles, you know. Right. The, and and what were they doing with these kids? The destruction that's happened to these kids while in state care. They would, you know, beat their language out of them, beat their culture out of them, so that they became completely colonized and and disconnected to their own fucker papa. I don't think it had any good intentions from the get go. I'm sorry. It's good to to hear that, though. I mean, from the outside, all I see is what the media reports. But hearing it from you, it's it's a very different perspective. And I, I feel like I'm getting the real story, what's truly happening. Growing up, I, I didn't even know what they were, to be honest. I was quite lucky. Um, state ward care would be something that my grandmother would be threatening me with if I kept playing on the road. They'll come and take right. you the welfare. But I didn't actually know what that meant. I just heard it was like a boogeyman and, and you know, <laughs> they'll come mm-hmm. and take me if I keep riding my bike on the road when I was like four or five. But I didn't know how real it was until this had happened and then the way that we were treated through this. And then you start meeting others because they heard about the story. And then you hear all the stories of what's happened around Aotearoa to many whanos. And it's it's horrible. Like the things that I've heard that people have gone through and they, they, they thank me for standing up to them. But the things that I've heard that they've gone through, it just makes me mumai. Like my heart just breaks for them because I actually had a really good childhood my upbringing was, I would say, was the, was the best because, like, I'm so opinionated now because of my childhood. <laughs> you know, knowledge was passed to me from my grandmother. I lived with my grandparents at a young age because both my parents worked full time. Um, so between, I think it was four, five and six, I was um, living with my nana and my koro and queen chef. And she taught me a lot. And it was a beautiful thing, my childhood, I think. I had everything, and I'm humble for that, everything that a child could want and some, including love and and the material world. But when I had gone through this experience and I had met a lot of people, I decided when they had taken my kids, I was going to use this time to build my platform and travel a lot. And I traveled a lot around New Zealand, around Aotearoa, and I would meet people along the way, you know, just go from BIP clubs, sittings to bonfires and campsites to meet people um, and listen to their stories. And it was it's horrific. It's just horrific the way that people have been treated in state care in our country. And as you see, it's starting to come out now in the global inquest into state ward care. You know, I hear about stories from all over the world, and that's one thing that really seems to stand out how state care or whatever child welfare system is in place in that country always seems to have failed the child. It's such a common thread throughout so many of the similarities of the story, but the fact that child welfare is involved and they could have saved the child. And then you have the whole extra layer of the systemic racism involved in your situation. It's just, it must just drive you nuts. Yeah, it opens my mind. It definitely opens my mind to my surroundings outside of my hapu, outside of my people the way that we are perceived, the way that we are treated. I try not to let it get to me in a negative way. I try to draw it. So my sub-tribe, Ngāti Kura, in the far north of Ngāpuhi Nui Tonu, we are the sub-tribe Kura, as translated to education. I try to draw the knowledge from the frustration to learn and understand more as to why things are happening and how we can fix that. That's a really good approach, I think. Just going at it from an emotional standpoint would be probably less effective. 
Yeah, that is, that's very true. Because I remember when I was at law school, I held a really good argument with one of my lecturers around um, dispatchery rate of Māori incarcerations. I had a teaching from Dr Moana Jackson around the Western structure that had arrived here in Aotearoa was never meant to work for our people, the justice system because it was designed for the brain configuration on the other side of the world that's completely different to the DNA makeup to our people here in Aotearoa. Um, And I remember being completely invested in that conversation because I knew that she was just trying to shut me down around the topic that I wanted to write about in my thesis. And I was accused of that being emotionally involved in that argument. So I tried not to do that a lot. You can still be passionate, but you can still be boring at the same time, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yep, that is true. (laughs) Some people probably think that about me. I don't doubt it. But right, if you have the passion behind you, it doesn't have to be all emotionally charged. You can definitely accomplish a lot of things. Mm, Just by staying calm. Just stay calm. One thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, because you had mentioned it yesterday, do you get recognized a lot? Yeah, that's the hoha thing. <laughs> hoha means annoying. <laughs> when, we, when we do go out, it's there's, there's a lot of pressure, I find sometimes in the public eye. But I've learned to just move past that and just, my grandmother taught me a stage trick was just imagine that everybody's in their underwear. You sort of don't feel like the uncomfortable elephant walking through the room, you know. Has the public been understanding or how's the reaction been? It's got to be very different because with you being so recognizable in your country, you know, when I started doing Moko's story on the podcast, nobody here had ever heard of him. And over there, it's he's a household name, I imagine. Yeah, as far as I know, South Dakota would have probably heard about him from his grandmother. (laughs) She's living in South Dakota, my mother, and probably her husband's family. He's a Native American. And yeah, I think it actually skipped past US and went to Europe, eh? Because I remember being slandered for it through court processes that something had been highlighted that far across the world. I was deemed to be not a suitable um, carer for my children. That's a lot to have to go through all at once. Yeah, it has its moments, but I I think because I've always been quite a private person, it doesn't happen all the time. And when it does, like when I do go out, I prepare myself for it. At first, it started like I remember four or five years ago, people just coming up to me and crying. And like when you've cried for days on end, I don't I don't know what to do other than just just hug them. And they'll just be saying sorry for what happened to me. And, and I, I I feel for them because in, in ways they've come out and said things that have happened in their life and it's been triggering for them from their past. And they were grateful that I've said something. I've had people anonymously contact my fan page, like who work in the system, who have said that they were grateful that somebody has finally stood up. Um, because they've had to deal with children who have gone through similar circumstances, but not to that extent where it's actually become a homicide um, and there's nothing that had been done about it. Another girl came up to me, I remember years ago, bawling her eyes out, saying that she was actually abused as a child in care and she was just crying. I didn't know who she is. She was a beautiful girl, though. She was very fair. And you know what? That's what opened my, my my eyes to, that this happens to all races, not just ours. Like I do strongly advocate for our own, but all children, no matter what colour there is, it's apparent to have happened to them in our country. Just remembering her, she was very fair with light brown hair. It was in point shave. I remember, I don't remember her name, but I remember she was beautiful. She was a very pretty girl. She maybe had been about her mid-twenties, but she was very well spoken. You know, that's just judging from the book's cover. It, it just looked like she had come from a well, well-respected well family and what she had said um, about the abuse that she had endured in care. I was shocked. We don't divide our colours when, when somebody has been very vulnerable like that, and I just hugged her. And then there's the bad ones, the bad times that have happened in the past where people know who you are, they won't say they know who you are, but they'll say subtle things to try and trigger you. Mm-hmm. Th- those are the ones that, you know, that their keyboard warrior crap online that I 
haven't even read. I'm sorry, but they made it apparent in there. Oh, my intuition picked up that they knew they knew something was going on. I would just fondle with their demons, honestly. <laughs> You know, when you when you've hit rock bottom before in life, you move past anything that you thought would hurt you, and you sort of just begin to play with their demons to get to the you know the core of the issue is that they had endured something too, and they never spoke up, and they're they're angry with themselves for not speaking up, or they've seen something, and I look at it that way. I try and look at it with empathy. Once I've demasked them and their demons that try to play with me and trigger me, it's taken me a long time to get that kind of strength in my mind to do stuff like that. But I still get the subtle ones here and there that try to, how we say here, come at me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's a really compassionate way to, to think about it. And it has to have taken you a while to develop a, a thick skin like that. A lot of mindfulness, a lot of meditation, a lot of travel. I find travel gives you power. You see a lot of different things. You hear a lot of different things. You learn a lot of different things. And then you sort of become more transparent in the way that you look at things in your mind. It gets so much more stronger. I I used to think being headstrong about a situation and just really stubborn was the way. But when you when you change that, you know, have that chip off your shoulder and that, that scratch on your lens and you look at it with a more open mind, I just have sympathy and compassion and sometimes pity for the real asshole ones. Sorry about my language, but honestly. No, you can <laughs> say whatever you like. <laughs> you're right, though. People can be there. They can be so cruel. And you're right. There's got to be something in there. Yeah. Yeah. There's been there's been some horrible ones. Or there was I remember there was one encounter. I was diving. I'd gone over to an island. I'm not going to say where, but I went over to an island and we were on a bit of a diving buzz and a pub crawl me and a couple of mates, and then I was confronted by someone who said some things that were quite triggering, and I thought, oh, okay, oh, this is where we're at, so I'll put my beers away, you know, <laughs> stop drinking now, now that you know that your <laughs> environment's unsafe, and then um, there was things said to me like, people like you with tattoos on your face, Ugh. never own land, never have a job in your life, and I was actually working at the news back then, <laughs> At Watu News, and I, I just had to laugh, and I said, "Oh, really? Have you ever been off this island, mate? Because I actually <laughs> own some land back on land. I actually own my own land, and it was inherited through all those descendants that you say have never owned land because they wore what we call mukokoe on their faces. I actually have a job. You sound like you have a problem. Do you, do you have something interesting to talk about on the breakfast show? I might consider giving you a <laughs> slot. And the look on his face, he was just infuriated. I remember him going really red and starting to scream at me. And then a bus, it was like divine timing that a bus had pulled over because it was a small island. And he just started, the bus driver just started yelling at this man and told him to get in the bus. And I was like, mate, you just saved his life. Take him away. <laughs> <laughs> Take him to another island. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Take him anywhere at this point. Yeah. I can't believe people have that kind of nerve to just confront someone. It's it's scary, you know, that they have the guts to do that. Luckily, you weren't trapped on a boat or something at the time. No, nah, even then, I'd just jump off and dive dive to another, <laughs> another life. <laughs> I don't find myself trapped in any situation after the hell I've been through. <laughs> There's always, as long as you've got a heartbeat, you can get out of anything, honestly. <laughs> yeah, that's a good outlook to have. And it's it's incredible that you've gotten there. You've done so much personal growth as well as helping other people. Had to, eh? You have to. In order to be able to support others, we've got to do the inner work ourselves. I've still got a long way to go. Like, I wouldn't boast that, you know, I've become immortal. I definitely have risen higher in my evolution. I find myself closer to my true self every day that I'm waking up, but I've still got a long way to go. We all do, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, you have done some amazing stuff and it, it's pretty inspiring. I know you, you said yesterday you're just a mom, but you're uh, you're a warrior mom. You're one of the ones that I would classify as, as a real warrior. Oh, thank you. But I think you're referring to my ancestors. They were warriors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> We're just uh, what we call tattoos in the concrete jungle now. (laughs) (laughs) 
there's there's been some times in life where I've been belittled as English is my second language mm-hmm. and Māori is my first because I didn't I didn't really care too much for English but when you get belittled for it um and then you, you you're called what's that word argumentative I call it passive suppression when people say you're argumentative but I I I look at it in a different lens you know we all have a different lens and I I think it's that I have the sense to be able to walk between the two worlds and see things differently and hear it and speak it differently and to be able to walk between two worlds when people try to put me down because you know English isn't my first language. I just look at it, oh, you know, automatically you would have to go into defence when somebody comes across more educated than you because if you only know that one language, you're not going to get too far. How can you connect with the other language? What else would you like to tell us about him? That I'm really proud of my son. He's done so much good in this world. For a naughty boy, he's done some big work, you know, and I understand why he was so headstrong now. Seeing the amazing work that he does in society is just, it makes me emotional. And I'm I'm, I'm quite a heartless person, people say. <laughs> when it comes to dealing with the cold face, sometimes, you you know, you've got to keep your skin tough. Otherwise, you, you start slipping. You know, people think that they can make you do the tumbelina. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the amount of stubbornness that he had and the headstrongness that he had, and I see the blow up that he's done all around Altero. Like, I, I want to chuck a big shout out to um, Safeguard Our Children down in Nelson. Um, they're working on their training processes and um, programs, and they've 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 reached out to me to ask what input we would like to put into it. Just working with them on the framework um, to roll out their processes for training, um, new frontline um, coming through, and you know just making simple fakatoki. That's all I've done because I thought oh, I had like all these policies in my mind, and I was like, no, just keep it simple. What kind of things did Moko like? What were his favorite things to do and favorite people and things like that? Um, Moko loved Kapaka. He would watch it in the evenings when it was time to cook dinner. That was sort of like the vibe that would calm him down to sit down because he was quite a hyper kid. So he would sit down and watch his cuppers on um, the Māori television in the evenings. Moko loved wild pig. He loved wild pigs. Like he liked his favorite was the chops. He liked wild pig chops. I used to make them with garlic. He loved that. He was a little tattoo because it was so cold and took it all. Like if I made it a lot and I put it in the fridge, he would get up late at night and he'd go and steal it out of the fridge. And he had a lot to eat, but you could hear somebody ruffling around in the kitchen and it was more cold. <laughs> Yeah, he loved the wild pig. Like, and and I'd have other meals, you know, leftovers wrapped up and put into the fridge um, from the night before. But that was his go-to. That a wild pork chop, and what was the other one? Oh, he loved lollies. He liked to speak to everyone and anyone. He didn't really care who you were, as long as he got your attention. And he just liked to make people laugh. Like he was a real character, honestly. <laughs> as much oh. as he drove me mad, he made me so happy, honestly. Because, or well, not, not happy oh. all the time, but it make me laugh. <laughs> what he used to do is, he was a staunch guy during the day. He was a three-year-old, but he was, you know, he was a little tough warrior. Walked around, no shoes, no shirt. If I try and put clothes and shoes <laughs> on him and make him look nice, it was just, it wasn't him. Like, he'd just pull it all apart slowly and he'd turn into this, you know, this little ninja by the end of the day. <laughs> but he used to go around acting tough to everybody. He was always, you know, oh, what's your name, man? My name's Moko. I'm mighty <laughs> notorious. That he used to say it was funny. But then it come nighttime and then, because I'd be trying to get him into the routine of sleeping in his room with his brother. And then I'd hear, no, mama. I was like, oh, what if it's a tough mighty? He's like, I'm going to cuddle my mummy. 
Oh. <laughs> and you can't say yeah, no to that. <laughs> I had to laugh at him honestly because you know you see this tough alpha male during the day. He was just my pride. My eyes would just always laze when I'd gaze at my son because he was such an alpha male. Like he was alpha to the point where he thought that he led the household, not his father, not his older brothers. He told <laughs> them where to go. <laughs> It was his house and his wow. rules, the funny things that he used to do, honestly. Some of it was really funny. This is sad, but it was kind of normalized when um, his father would go off to jail. My son would jump on the couch because he'd see the police coming and he'd start getting excited. He'd be looking out the window and he'd get excited because he knew his father was off or they'd be looking for his father. <laughs> he'd start yelling out, oh, dad, you're right, dad. <laughs> <laughs> because then he knew he didn't have to fight for the, the man of the house role. It, it would be at his own, his own time, his own way. He was a handful, but I loved it. Like he was my little man. He was my baby. He didn't like to be too affectionate around people. When he was shy, yeah, he'll cling to me. But it was at night time that was our time where he would turn back into my baby. But during the day, he was a real alpha man. He liked to climb things. He'd climb up on my garage. He'd climb up on top of my vehicles. Oh my yeah, goodness. and I'd get tired, and I was pretty fit back then, and I'd get tired trying to chase him because you go from one side of the vehicle because I had a van at the time, and then you'll run to the other side on the oh roof, and you're having anxiety attacks because you think this kid's going to tip over the side. But he's laughing his head off. He was a character. He was a real character. I'm grateful that he got to experience love um, in the short period of time. He had a girlfriend named Hayley at um, Kindy. I sent them to Kindy because I understood that our real was very alive and very prominent in our home. My babies were embedded to their fucker papa. They know who they are and where they came from in terms of my family, anyways. So I put him into this um, English daycare and he had this girlfriend named Hayley. Well, he actually stole Hayley from his older brother. <laughs> yeah, there was a big fight over that. And I, I, when they come home and they were scrapping about it, I was like, I've got to check this out. I've got to see who this Hayley is. So I went down there and, and, uh, and I saw her and she was gorgeous. She was this little girl and she, she made both of my sons stand up on a chair. I never forgot that day because they both got haircuts done and she said, Turn around, Moko. So he turns around on this chair, does his little toodle, and then tells the other brother, turn around. At that point, like I started raging because, you know, you feel like your baby boys have been ripped from you because another woman has control over your yeah. baby. <laughs> and I was like, right, time to get off the chairs, right. pack up, time. <laughs> So I just remembered <laughs> the look on his face when he knew that he stole his brother's girlfriend, Hayley. And Hayley, I ended up finding out, was actually one of um one of the other netball teams that I used to play against. Um, it was one of the mums. I was like, oh, my son was supposed to marry your daughter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I think I had asked her if she wanted to be a part of the march with Hayley um, at the front because that was his missus in his mind. He told me, I've got a missus, mum. Yeah. He said, oh, you've got a missus, eh? And he goes, yeah, it's Hayley. She loves me. <laughs> oh. oh, does she now? <laughs> well, you tell Hayley, Hayley can wash your undies. Hayley can cook your dinner. Hayley can put you to bed at night. <laughs> when he was going through his stages of trying to settle him into his own bed, it never worked. But, you know, you try the gig out because I had other children before that. But, like, you sort of start kicking back on the whole trying to put them into their routine you sort of give up at that stage uh, yeah. <laughs> he was like a little ninja coming down the hallway I remember honestly he would like crawl because he'd have his nappy on and his thing that he'd strip out of his pajamas because he was like frustrated that he had to even do things a certain way that he didn't want to do things so he'd strip down and he'd just be in his nappy and you could see this little nappy just crawling down the hallway because I'd turn all the lights off and then peek and then I could see him just just this little, like he's on the ground and I just see like this white bit pop up because it was the nappy and he's like doing this ninja turtle walk along the ground. <laughs> he was funny, honestly. And then by the time he got to my room, I'd just be cracking up laughing. I'd just, you know, you're over it by this. Get in bed, cut it out. It's, oh, my mama. Aww. You know, his sweet voice. My mummy. Yeah. Yeah, he always won. <laughs> yeah. He was my little power. 
I always called him my power, my pride and my joy. He was my joy, definitely. Well, he sounds like a, an absolutely entertaining kid at all times. He was, honestly. He used to talk to anyone and everyone. I remember they the kids wanted to go on for a ride on the train, so I took them on a train one time, and um, he started talking to these kids, and I was listening to them, and he was so free-spirited, honestly. These kids, he was like, oh, what are you up to, eh? Have you got a patch? It's just something that kids say back in that circle in those days. And then these kids will be telling him about train. They're up to train hopping and like telling him like what that is, where they, you know, they catch different trains without paying. And he was just like, hey, five years are cool. <laughs> 23, like he didn't judge anyone, eh? as you do when you're that, that young and you're innocent to the world and you don't know any better. But he was just such a happy soul. When he when he went off his rocket, though, I'll admit he he made sure that the whole household knew what was up. <laughs> he did nothing at a small scale. <laughs> no, he was larger than life, honestly. I slept really good with him in my life because I was so knackered <laughs> from trying to get case and. I remember I'd I'd have people knocking on on the door telling me that my naked kid's standing up at the window (laughs) and it was him. Or, you know, you go to hang out the washing, so you open the back door, he follows you out, and then he's taken off down the road and you jump in the car and you go looking for him. And he's gone down to his sister's girlfriend's house (laughs) and he's sitting on the fence there. And he's only three. He's sitting on the fence trying to call out to the girls. And I'm like, I pull out, what are you doing, Moko? He's like, oh, I said friends mum what what are you doing at friends <laughs> <laughs> that's just so cute he was just so outgoing <laughs> yeah he was he was full of life every day you know his downtime was when he was ready yeah not when anybody else told him it was downtime and I think that's why we couldn't have him at Kohanga too is because he wasn't gonna go down if he was told to go down because they had nap times when the child's tired they'll take themselves to go nap they didn't really have a routine. Um, and I was like, oh, they're going to struggle with the son. Yeah. <laughs> He's not going to listen. <laughs> He'll just go and go and go. Oh, he sounds amazing. He just sounds like he was a little adult in a tiny body. <laughs> he was. He was a very wise man, very cheeky man. I'm sitting there looking at his photo now. He's poking tongues at me in his photo. He was just that kind of person. He loved his rides and his pram. We'd walk everywhere just so that he could see everything. And in the car, sometimes it was a little bit unsafe because, well, most of the times I'd I'd sort of, you know, just hope for the best on every car ride because he'd climb out of his seat. He was like a Houdini, literally. He got out of his um, buckles. Right. Oh, he was so clever. Either that or strong. He'd break them eventually, the buckles. And I'd be driving and, and then I see people staring at me like like ghosts. And I'm like, what's wrong? And then I turn around and it's my kid. He's like, you know, the hand railings that above the doors when you climb out of the car. He's like holding on to it, doing somersaults, you know, swinging oh. on the <laughs> and and I'm like, how the hell did I not see that? You know, and because he's so quiet when he's doing it, right? Or he'll torment his his siblings in the back of the car, just torment the heck out of them until they start crying. And oh. so sometimes it was better to just take him in a pram and just let him let him because he was quiet because he could see everything that was going on. Okay, and you know, it was it was at his pace, um, and he knew how far he could or how long he could watch it because we'd be going up towards it and then walking past it, whether it was a tree that fascinated him or you know a specific person sitting there. He was a very what's that word? A visual person. I wouldn't say he was a very um, theoretical. He wasn't really into reading much. He was very visual. He liked to watch things more than read. He did. He was a really fast learner and he didn't see the difference. He didn't he didn't comprehend what was for adults and what was for kids. It, w- it wouldn't stick in his mind. So he would look at you like, what's wrong with you? you know, if I, if you can do it, why can't I do it? It doesn't make sense. And like you would just have that serious look on his face like, no, no, no. No, if they're doing it, I can do it too. You know? yeah, yeah. Step aside, <laughs> let me take over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're not doing it right. I'll do it right for you. you know? <laughs> He was just that way inclined. That's amazing. He just had such a huge personality. Uh Uh-huh. Big personality, honestly. 
He does sound amazing. And I'm, I'm so glad we got to hear more about him from you. It means so much because we can only learn so much from news articles and things like that. But hearing it from you is, is really special. Oh, you're welcome. Just remember him for his sandals. He loved his sandals. Those are like, um, what do you call those sandals? Okay, right. Or his bare feet. He liked wearing no shoes, no shirt. <laughs> There's a lot of pictures of him no shirt. <laughs> mm, minimal pants, honestly. <laughs> he loved to run wild. That was my son all over. He was like a wild thornberry. <laughs> <laughs> he just wanted to get back to nature. <laughs> Literally, that was when he found his chief. We used to go camping and he was so happy. Those days were good days. He loved camping. Huge thanks to Nicola for taking the time to talk to me, despite our 16-hour time difference. Like I told her, it's one thing to read about these kids in the news or on Facebook, but it means so much more to hear about them from the people who love them most. I wish her and her kids all the happiness in the world. They certainly deserve it. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another episode. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from audiojungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.